and we're good. So um, the main topic for today is going to be classification. So we, we're still going to be working with um, vector space models that we um, spent the last lecture talking about. But today we're going to take um, one more step and move from sort of just so last time we talked about the problem of representing sort of individual data objects in the space, in a vector space model. And today we're going to be talking about how to represent classes and how to perform what's known as classification. Um, so we'll get to all of that, but I thought first I would just spend sort of um, a couple of slides very briefly, quickly recapping sort of the gist of what we talked about in the previous lecture just to make sure um, so we're all on the same page. And since what we'll be doing today and in the later lectures sort of uh, will build on what we did in the last lecture, it's just important that we get sort of uh, uh, the groundwork in place. Okay, so semantic spaces was this uh, notion that we, that we introduced in the last lecture, right? That combines essentially two things. So one was this idea of um, vector space modeling this general framework for how to represent data in a geometrical model. <coughs> and the other main thing was this idea of um, distributional semantics, or the, the so-called distributional hypothesis, right? That postulated that we could can say something about what um, a given word means, what the semantics is for a given word, just by looking at the context in which uh, uh, the word is used the context sort of gathered from um, from a large collection of, of texts, what we call a, a, a corpus. Okay, so um, a vector space model, if you remember, um, it's basically built on this geometrical metaphor, and it's uh, we can use the vector space model to represent basically um, anything, really, although we used it for representing words. It can be used for anything. So um, the... Um, the general idea is that the dimensions in the space rep corresponds to properties of the um, of the data objects that we want to represent. Right. So here's an example uh, of a three-dimensional um, vector space model representing words. So you see, we have three dimensions um, corresponding to the property of co-occurring together with the verbs bake or share or eat. Okay, and then we have for example, words positioned in this vector space model, or effectively a semantic space model. We have bread and cake and cheese and taxi. So looking at this, at, at this particular space, we see that um, uh, cheese, cake, and bread, they all score high along the uh, dimension corresponding to eat. They've all been seen in the corpus multiple times, co-occurring with the verb eat. Um, we also see that bread and cake seem to be the two objects closest in our space because they've also been seen to co-occur um, frequently with the word bake. And then we have taxi down here. Uh, it's similar to to um, the other words in terms of having co-occurred with the word share. But we see that taxi... Uh, score is low in terms of co-occurring with bake and eat, as you would expect, right, compared to these other ones. So just by recording co-occurrence um, uh, counts of words throughout um, uh, a large enough text collection, we're able to automatically sort of um, infer what words have similar meanings and what words have, have di dissimilar meanings. Um, I mean, here we, we just sort of see immediately, s just visually, that, that the words are close in the space. But as we talked about last time, there are sort of mathematically well-defined ways that we can actually measure this distance using things like the Euclidean distance or uh, the cosine measure. But so the, the um, an important idea here is that we have these sort of three lev levels of um, abstraction here. So what we want to try to get our hands on here is finding what words are semantically related or semantically similar. And then by way of this distributional hypothesis, we say that, okay, we can, we can approach 
semantic similarity by looking at distributional similarity. So we can say that semantic similarity um, probably corresponds roughly to to um, having similar contexts. And then we took one more step saying that we will model what it means to be distributionally similar um, in terms of being geometrically close um, um, in such a, such a vector space model. Right? <coughs> and this is, of course, what you've been asked to implement in uh, uh, obligatory assignment to A. Uh, hopefully most of you have had a time to, to look at by now. So the deadline for 2A is um, in a week. So for assignment 2A, you've basically been given uh, a list of words, a list of 122 words, together with um <coughs> a corpus, a sample of 20,000 sentences from a uh, uh, brown corpus. And then you've been asked to sort of create um, uh, feature vectors for all of these words based on features that you extract from this brown corpus. And we asked you to, so we talked about last time how you can define context in different ways. So what it means for something to, um, um, so when it comes to sort of determining these, these dimensions in the space, right, what features they correspond to. That's something which is up to us. We get to sort of um, design our features and d decide on what the features shall be. And we saw that one way of defining context could be uh, looking at properties of the grammatical context in which a word appear. Um, it could be looking at sort of a given number of words to the left and to the right of the words. Or it could be uh, the most straightforward way of defining context, which is what you've been asked to do for assignment 2A, namely using a bag of words approach. So basically we take the, the context of a word to correspond to all the other words that co-occur together with it um, within a sentence. Um, so that what, what that's what we've asked you to do for, for 2A, and the space you end up with obviously won't have just three dimensions, as you see here, it will have several thousands of dimensions. Um, and then once you've created such a vector space, You'd be you'll be able to, um, after you've, you've also implemented, uh, for example, a cosine measure for computing the distance between these feature vectors representing your words, we'll be able to, to say sort of what, um, what words are, are close together in the space and, um, uh, and sort of by way of this distributional hypothesis, then what words are semantically similar. And the import important thing uh, here is sort of that we're able to, to do this without any prior knowledge, without hand encoding in any way to our model what words uh, mean similar things. It, it all just falls out of the data, right? We don't need to, uh, we need to specify the features. Um, so that's where sort of the manual work comes in. But we don't specify in any way what words, uh, uh, we don't specify any of our own prior knowledge in terms of what words uh, are semantically similar. <coughs> it's all just something that uh, um, the data tells us. Okay, so one thing that we also mentioned last time is that these vector space models are sort of, uh, entirely general. We happen to use them for representing word meaning, and each vector in our model will correspond to uh, a given word type. But they can also be used for, um, they can and are used for uh, a multitude of, of, of other problems. And sort of vector encodings of data are also sort of fundamental to, to very many uh, machine learning methods. But one important sort of other um, domain where uh, vector space models are used a lot uh, is within information retrieval. I just wanted to point that out since some of the background reading you've been asked to do for today and for the coming lectures is from uh, the Manning Raghavan Schütze book on information retrieval. And here they use vector space models for uh, a slightly different purpose. So the framework and all the sort of conceptual stuff and all the math and everything is, uh, is just the same. But they use vector space models for representing something slightly different than what we're doing in for, for, the, um, uh, for the assignments. 
So just thought I'd spend one quick slide on that as well. So when uh, vector space models are used in information retrieval, where the goal is to sort of identify what documents are about similar things, so what documents have roughly similar content, or perhaps the problem of retrieving relevant documents given a search query. Um, so for these problems, the, the vectors or the points in our vector space represent not individual word types, but um, entire documents. So e each document um, from a given document collection will correspond to one feature vector. And the features of the vector vector will correspond to uh, all the words that occur in the document. So, so th this means that when we then measure the distance between vectors in such a vector space model, um, that will represent sort of how similar two given documents are. So if two documents are found to be closely positioned in the space, that would mean that they uh, uh, that they tend to contain many of the same words, which again we can of course take to imply that they uh, they're probably about the same sort of stuff, similar topics. So such sort of um, term document vectors can be used for identifying what documents are similar, but it can also be used for retrie retrieving what documents are most relevant given the query. So we can also, if you type in a search query, type in some keywords that we want to um, uh, search for, uh, that query can too be represented as a feature vector in the same space. And that means we can immediately rank documents in terms of their relevance to that query, just by, um, by, by computing these uh, measures of geometrical distance in the space. Okay, so that was just a quick note on how vector space models are used when you read the Manning Raghavan Schütze book. But it's sort of very important to, to, to realize that sort of the, the main idea is the same, and the main concepts are the same. The whole machinery and the framework is the same. Um, it's just that we can use, use these models to represent sort of arbitrary um, problems. Okay, so that was a quick recap, plus some more. And then finally for um, today's sort of main topic, um, we'll be turning to, to classification, um, an important, uh, important track within the field of machine learning. So we'll start by, by um, briefly introducing sort of the idea of classification, uh, what the purpose is. Then we'll talk a bit about how to represent classes and class membership in vector space models. And then we'll go through the details of two examples of um, classifiers, namely uh, Rocchio classifiers and, and K nearest neighbor classifiers. Okay, so that's the, that's the plan for the remaining uh, part of the lecture. Um, so before we start talking in detail about classification, I just want to mention that there are sort of two main tasks dealing with categorization within uh, machine learning. So one is what we call clustering, which we'll be talking about for the next couple of lectures. And then there's classification that we'll be dealing with today. So. Um, the difference between clustering and classification is typically uh, described as the difference between what we call unsupervised learning on the one hand and supervised learning on the other. So clustering is an instance of what we call unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning means that we don't provide the learner or the algorithm with uh, predefined examples of what it is we want to learn. Instead, the algorithm sort of relies on uh, uh some notion of self-organization. Um, so with, with clustering, the goal is to automatically identify groups within the data that we provide. But we, we don't tell it in advance of what we want those groups to be, what we want those groups to correspond to. We just pour the data into uh, the clustering method, and it will try to come up with uh, uh, groups or categories within that data by itself. Whereas in 
Classification, on the other hand, which is an example of what we call supervised learning, um, we instead start by providing um, uh, the classification method with what we call labeled data. So examples of um, the classes that, we, that we'd like to identify in the data. And then the goal is to, to train a classifier based on these sort of labeled uh, examples of, uh, of classes. Um, with the goal to then try to, to correctly predict the class labels for new unseen instances. So for example, we could, um, uh, since we just talked about representing documents in a vector space model, we could have uh, labels for, for documents um, specifying what topics they're about. So for example, this document is about sports, this document is about um, international politics, this document is about entertainment, these other documents are also about sports again, and so on. So that would be our training data. So we would provide that to the, to the classification algorithm, and it will try to, to learn statistical patterns um, that correlate with these different labels. And then when given a new unlabeled data, a document with no provided label, it should then be able to correctly tell us what topic label it should have. So, okay, this document appears to be about sports, so this document is about international politics. But so classification, this example of supervised learning is what we'll be dealing with today, and then we'll go back to looking at unsupervised learning and clustering um, in, the, in the next lecture. Okay, so before we start going into details about classification algorithms, and before that even looking at details about how to represent classes within the vector space model, I just thought I'd quickly go through some other examples of actual classification tasks, just so things get a bit more concrete. Um, so here are some, some classic examples of uh, um, classification tasks um, from sort of the broad field of, of natural language processing. Um, so named entity recognition, for example, that's a, a classic problem. So here the problem would be to, to look at running text and then be able to correctly identify what words are uh, so-called proper nouns, so names, and what types of names do they correspond to? Are they person names or location names or names of organizations, for example? Um, so if reading in, uh, uh, so if I say that, um, 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 we're now all at the University of Oslo, then we should be able to correctly predict that uh, Oslo is a proper name and it's um, uh, a name denoting a geographical location. And the University of Oslo is also a proper name denoting an institution. Because this would be an example of, of named entity uh, classification. Document classification is another uh, classic example like we just talked about, sort of automatically classifying documents as to whether they're about sports or politics or something else. Um, authorship attribution is another example, so um, if we provide a classifier with um, a document, we should be able to tell us who authored uh, the text, what person has, um, has written uh, the provided text. So the training data then would be documents or text snippets paired with the name of the author. And then the goal would be to, to build up some model of um, sort of statistical regularities that allow us to to um, predict uh, who is the author um, given the text. Sentiment analysis um, has received a lot of attention over the, uh, the last few years. So here the problem is to, to try to identify um, um, opinions, for example, uh, within the text. Um, either sort of fine-grained opinions, but most often uh, uh, just a polarity, whether it's negative or positive. So this is used, for example, by, by companies for uh, tracking product reviews, for example. If you have a sentiment analysis uh, uh, model, we could provide it with a product review, um, and the model would tell us whether it's a positive or negative review. Spam filtering, of course, is another 
uh, textbook classic when it comes to introducing classification. So um, our training data then would, would, uh, would correspond to uh, a set of emails annotated as to whether uh, the email is spam or whether it's um, uh, non-spam. <coughs> okay, so we'll be looking at two simple examples of um, sort of classification frameworks that we can use for uh, th that we could train for performing such a task, um, namely Rockio classification and and K nearest neighbor classification. And both ha both of these classifiers sort of operate uh, on vector space representations of uh, of the data. So there are also many other classifiers that we could have uh, used as examples. Um, but some nice properties of these ones is that they they're, they're they're easy to sort of explain based on these intuitions uh, that we have about geometrical models. Um, it's easy to get sort of an, an intuitive understanding of, of, of how they work, while other classifiers that instead of, uh, that rather than building on a vector space representation, build on uh, a probabilistic representation of the data, for example. Um, Another nice feature of Rockio and KNN classifiers is that they generalize very easily to, to multi-class problems, so classification problems where you have many classes. Well, many other classifiers are more naturally restricted to just binary classification. Okay, but um, before we go into the details of any of those methods, we'll just spend a couple of slides on how to represent classes and how to represent class membership in vector space models. So up to now, what we talked about in the previous lecture and what you'll be doing in the current obligatory assignment, we're dealing with how to represent sort of um, single data objects, so word types, when it comes to the um, to assignment 2A. Um, but what we want to be doing now, we want to be able to represent collections of objects within these vector space models. And also represent the membership that a given data point might have to such a class. Um, um, and sort of very straightforwardly, um, um, a given class um, can basically just be thought of as a collection of objects. But uh, in the particular context of our vector space models, um, a class would correspond to a region within the space. Um, and vector space classifiers like Rockio and, and KNN rely on something uh, known as the uh, contiguity hypothesis. Um, what that basically means is that we will, t we will assume that these regions that correspond to, to collect collections of objects in the space um, form contiguous regions. That is, they, uh, they're sort of located in the same area within the space rather than being spread out and uh, uh, we'll also assume that they're, they're not overlapping. So this contiguity hypo hypothesis is also sometimes known as the cluster hypothesis. Okay, so we'll, we'll assume that these, these regions corresponding to, to classes in the space uh, correspond to sort of um, uh, coherent non-overlapping regions. So in, in the example that you see here, which is taken from the Manning Raghavan Schütze, Schütze book, we have um, three classes corresponding to the labels China, uh, Kenya, and, and the UK. Um, so the objects here are, we, we can assume that they are documents, and that the class labels correspond to uh, what the documents are about. So here are the, uh, the diamonds correspond to objects within the UK class. The circles correspond to documents uh, from the topic of China, while the X's correspond to uh, Kenya. And then the star here in the drawing corresponds to an unlabeled document that we now want to label, um, an object that we want to classify, an object that we want to to give to our model and predict what, what is the class labeled. 
And so in terms of what, it, what classification amounts to, uh, I'm working with these vector space classifiers. So it basically amounts to computing these boundaries in the space that delineate uh, the regions of, th of the different classes. So we call the decision boundaries. So that's sort of the lines that have been drawn up here are the decision boundaries separating the classes. And for the example here, we see that uh, the star, the unlabeled example, falls within the region corresponding to, to China. So that will be the label that we assign, um, assign to this document. But as we'll see, there are, there are many different wi ways of how to actually compute these decision boundaries. That's the whole sort of task of the classifier. And exactly how these class boundaries are, uh, are computed or, or drawn um, also depends on how we choose to represent classes in the model. And that's what we'll turn to first. So perhaps the most straightforward way of how to, to represent the class um, it's basically just to, to not really represent the class at all. <laughs> just say that a given class just represent uh, just corresponds to all the members that fall within the class. So there's no abstraction. We just say that the um, we'll just remember all the all the points, all the all the training examples that we've been given. Uh, they're labeled for a given class, and say that the set or collection of all of those points. Uh, We'll take that to represent the class. Um, and different strategies, different variations of this, this idea is used within what's called memory-based learning or, or instance-based based learning. Um, not all of these varieties are, are so straightforward like uh, uh, the strategy we, we just sketched, sort of just keeping all the points, but maybe trying to to compute a uh, representative subset for example of the of the examples and let that represent the class um, another variant is to use what's known as medoids um, sort of word play on on the concept of, of medians as opposed to a, a mean so a medoid would be um, the strategy of, of taking a class to be represented by that the single class member that seems to be most representative or typical of that class. So such such a group member could um, um, be chosen, for example, by, by computing the pairwise uh, similarities that, that that all that all objects have to the other objects within the class, and take the ones the one that has the um, uh, the highest average similarity. And say this seems to be the most representative. Exemplar or instance within within the group will take this to represent our space. Uh, we'll take this to represent our, our class. Um, so there's still not much going on in terms of abstraction here, but at least um, this would give us the idea of having sort of a prototype representing the class. Um, and another strategy based on this idea of, of finding a prototype, a single point, a single representative. Um, data point to represent the class is to use centroids. Um, but as a in contrast to the medoid strategy, a centroid doesn't necessarily need to correspond to an actual member of the class. Instead, a centroid is based on um, basically just computing an average of all the uh, the objects within the space, so all the points or all the vectors, not in the space or within the class. So all the feature vectors for the members within the class, we compute the average of all those feature vectors that will give us a new feature vector, um, which will be the, the centroid vector. Um, so in the formula you see here for computing um, a centroid mu for a given class i, and so wh what it does is that it basically um, takes all the vectors, all the feature vectors labeled uh, with the same class, um, sums them together and um, divides them by the number of members, so that we get we get an average. So each each feature value in the centroid vector will represent the average of that feature value throughout the class. 
but yeah, so again, we have this idea of uh, um, a prototype. And at least now, there's kind of there's some abstraction in the picture, right? Because this doesn't this no longer corresponds to an actual giving example. Um, it will represent uh, at, lea at least it won't uh, uh, it won't necessarily uh, coincide with the with an, ac with an actual member. Um, but with both metoids and centroids, we would be able to to compute some notion of typicality for the other members within the class by looking at the distance that the that the class members have towards the prototype, right, towards the metoid or towards the centroid. Um, and note that some of these sort of questions about how to represent um, classes sort of coincide with, with parallel discussions within uh, so-called prototype theory within linguistics and, and psychology, where uh, the question is, is rather how, how we represent classes uh, uh, mentally and, and this notion of typicality. So I mean, we too will be able to, uh, uh, if I ask you to think about the class corresponding to, um, to birds, for example, and say, what's a typical bird? Most of you will be able to come up with some suggestions. Uh, most of you will probably form some sort of mental image when I ask you to think of a, a typical bird. But then the question is sort of how do we, how do we represent that class? Is it all the, is it the set? of all the birds that you've ever seen in your life? Is that your mental representation of the class birds? Or is it some particular very representative member of that class? So the medoid approacher. Is it, for example, um, something like a, a magpie or a sparrow or something that you would feel is sort of the, the prototypical uh, example of a bird? Or is it maybe some sort of um, freakish average bird, which would correspond to the centroid version, some sort of idea of a bird that sort of averages all the most salient bird-like features uh, uh, that you associate with birds. Um, so, for example, when if we're told uh, uh, to rate the typicality of um, penguins, for example, which is a bird, that would score low. Um, and it should probably also score low uh, uh, in our vector space model if we have, regardless of whether we use the medoid or the centroid based approach, uh, a penguin would be sort of an, an outlier in our uh, uh, class corresponding to birds, right? And that also highlights a potential problem with, um, with the centro centroid based approach because that might be sort of unduly influenced by outliers in the class that would tend to sort of pull the, uh, the centroid uh, away from the, uh, the actual uh, center of the class, if you would. Um, potential more informative way of computing centroids than, than including, uh, than computing it from all the class members would be to maybe first try to compute some idea of what are the most representative class members because we already have a way of doing that, right? That we talked about in terms of how to to um, determine a medoid by looking at the average pairwise similarities within a class, and we could compute the centroid based just on those members. That would maybe give us a more more representative um, centroid. Um, okay, many digressions to take when in talking about how to represent classes. I think I'll. Um I'll move on. I think this is all stuff that I already said. Um, well, here is one other idea, actually, um, the terms, the idea of distance weighting. So we re related to what we just talked about in terms of um, how we can compute a centroid based on sort of a more representative sample of the class members. Um, another related idea would be to to compute the centroid to go back again to the the centroid formula. That we that we would here include some sort of distance weighting based on um, uh, how representative the uh, the different class members are, so that the more peripheral uh, data object would contribute less to the to the centroid. Okay, 
moving on. So that was sort of some ideas about how we can represent classes within the space. Um, now we'll spend one slide on how to represent the membership that a given object may hold towards uh, a given class. So classes can uh, can be what we call hard, or they can be what we call soft. So with hard classes or, or hard membership functions, um, membership is seen to be sort of an either-or property, a, a Boolean property. Either something is a member of a given category or it is not. Um, so hard classes uh, or hard membership functions are sometimes also called crisp. Crisp membership functions. Um, and one variant of this is that we could still allow objects to be members of several several classes, um, but we'd sta still say that uh, uh, membership to either one of those classes is Boolean. Either it is a member or it is not. Um, on the other hand, we have so-called soft classes, where sort of the membership that an object has towards a class is taken to be graded in some sense. So it could be based on the distance that the object has towards um, um, the region corresponding to the class or the, um, the centroid, for example, like we just discussed. Or it could be probabilistic, so that the, um, the degree of membership could be uh, uh, a function restricted to the interval 0 or, or 1, um, uh, also with the constraint that the, the sum of membership that an object has uh, across classes must, must sum to 1. So a slight variation of this is to have, uh, that is sometimes used, is to have fussy memberships. So again, uh, the membership is graded and given by uh, some value between 0 and 1. But with fussy values, we don't have this probabilistic constraint that, they, uh, that the memberships must sum to 1. Um, so to maybe provide some more intuitions about the difference between probabilistic and fussy. So probabilities and fussy values sort of both deal with uncertainty uh, in some sense, but in rather different ways. So um, with probabilities, we could think of something like, uh, let's say we want to classify something as being hot or cold. And um, if we say that something belongs to the class uh, cold with probability 0.0, that would seem to mean, that would seem to say something about our uncertainty as to, to whether this, this thing is actually cold. Um, whereas if we, so, so that entails that it, mi it might very well be that the, the object is actually hot, but we've assigned um, sort of some some score reflecting our confidence in how strongly we uh, we believe that the, this object um, should file under the category uh, called. If you had a fussy membership value of 0 0.0 towards the class called, that would instead mean that we just uh, um, uh, take the notion of being hot or cold as sort of a graded uh, uh, sort of continuous property instead, right, reflecting the fact that things can be more or less cold or more or less hot. Okay, so probabilities and fussy fussiness both deal with sort of, sort of uncertainties in, in measurements, but in rather sort of different uh, ways ep uh, epistemologically. Okay, so this stuff won't be sort of um, very important uh, uh, for sort of understanding what we'll be saying next about uh, classifiers, but it provides sort of uh, some background uh, in terms of just knowing that there are there are many design choices when it comes to um, how you want to define uh, what a class corresponds to and and, uh, and defining uh, class memberships. Okay, so um, I think we have time just before the break to just dive right into the details of the first classifier that we'll be looking at, uh, Rockio classification. And a Rockio classifier is also known as the uh, a nearest prototype classifier or a nearest centroid classifier. Um, 
and it, it's typically used as a, 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 a known by these other names, nearest centroid classifier or nearest prototype classifier um, outside of the domain of, of information retrieval. It's typically known as Rocchio classification when, when we're dealing with uh, uh, information retrieval and, and, and document classification. Okay, but a Rocchio classifier uses this centroid-based definition of a class, um, which was one of the examples of how to represent classes that we just talked about. Okay, so um, for us, uh, uh, by the Rocchio classifier, each each class will be represented by um, the centroid vector corresponding to the the average of all the, um, the feature vectors labeled with that class in the training data. Okay, and then when it comes to classifying some new unknown, unlabeled uh, data, um, that is done using a very simple decision rule, namely just compute all the, the distances of the feature, feature vector for the point we're about to classify towards these centroid vectors and then just assign it the class label uh, that corresponds to the, the nearest centroid. So there's very little sort of training actually going into to, uh, to building a Rocky Hill classifier. All it amounts to is to compute the centroid vectors. That's sort of all the, all the learning that is involved. Then once we, so that would correspond to sort of our our model, just a set of these centroid, centroid vectors, these average vectors, corresponding to the different class labels. And then the actual classification just amounts to computing uh, the distance from an object to be classified towards these centroids. And then assigning the, the, the corresponding, corresponding label. But what will, so the the sort of main idea of what goes on in a Rocky classifier is um, is very simple. One of the sort of simplest classifiers that we can uh, 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 that we uh, uh, that one can describe actually. And um, uh, what we'll look into a bit more after the break is sort of how these centroids that the model computes defines the boundaries of, of the of the class regions. Um, so what effect the centroid-based representation of the classes, what effect that has on um, the class boundaries that, the, that our model uh, effectively computes. But I think we'll save that for, for after the break and then pick up again in, in 15 minutes. Okay, so we... We left off uh, having just sort of detailed the uh, um, the core idea of the of the Rocky o classifier. Right, it um, we provided with training data consisting of data objects paired with class labels. Then it computes the centroids corresponding to each of the classes. That's the model. And then, when performing classification, it computes so for for a given new item to be classified, it computes all the pairwise distances from that point to the different centroids and assigns it the class label uh, corresponding to the, the nearest centroid in the model. So very straightforward uh, and very simple. But now let's look at sort of how, how this centroid-based representation of the classes and this um, uh, decision rule that we just outlined, um, what effect that has on these uh, these class boundaries uh, that are computed in the space. Um, so again, this is an illustration taken from the Manning Raghavan Schütze book. I know um, a few people have found sort of this particular illustration illustration to be <laughs> to be difficult to to understand at sort of the first first glance. So I thought I'd I'd spend just a couple of comments on how to interpret um, this illustration. So. Uh, what it's supposed to, whoops, 
Your phone is okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, uh, the the boundaries that are that end up being computed in a space using a central uh, this nearest central classifier um, uh, corresponds to the uh, to to uh, boundaries that correspond to the set of points that are equally distant to the different um, centroids. So that we that's what we see here. When you see the the line separating. Uh, the UK class from the Kenya class, uh, we see sort of uh, A1 corresponds to the length from the UK centroid, um, and A2 is the, the length from the, the Kenya centroid. We see that these are uh, uh, the point on the line where uh, these two meet are, are equally distant from the two, the two centroids. So the line here corresponds to all the points that are equally distant from, from these two centroids. This line corresponds to the points that are equally distant from the China centroid or the, or the Kenya centroid and so on. Um, <coughs> and of course here we only have two dimensions, so we draw these class boundaries as, as just lines. But this generalizes uh, to higher dimensional models uh, where we talk of these boundaries corresp corresponding to uh, a hyperplane rather than, than a line. So it would be a, a plane in three dimensions and a hyperplane in, in a higher dimensional space. But the idea is the same, right? That the, uh, that the separating hyperplane uh, corresponds to all the points that are equally distant to, uh, to these pairs of, pairs of centroids. Um, there's one good question I thought during the break in terms of what, what happens after classification are so like in the example here we classify this star here in the picture corresponds to an unlabeled object to be classified that will be classified as China we see it because it falls on uh, on that side of the decision boundary do we then update the centroid for the class uh, China and in general the answer to that is no um, but there are sort of instances of um, uh, machine learning classifiers where we actually let the decisions of the classifier feed back into the classification model itself. Um, so these models are, are typically known as uh, performing what we call self-training. So if we do self-training, then um, we let the, the classification decisions sort of feed back into the, into the classifier. So of course, then one has to, to take some care that we might risk of propagating errors, reinforcing the same uh, errors in the model. So one thing we could do if we wanted to do self-training with, with the Rocky classifier, we could um, immediately have some measure of confidence in our classification decisions based on the how far away from a centroid a point is. Right, so here the star is fairly close to the China centroid. So we can be fairly confident that it's but this, this is probably correct. If instead it was sort of um, equally, almost equally close to the other centroids, or it was perhaps a complete outlier being sort of way uh, um, uh, far away from, uh, from the China centroid or any of the other centroids, then we might say, okay, we, we can't have much confidence in this particular classification decision. So we will not let this sort of um, feedback into our model. Uh, we won't update our, our centroid. Okay, but, but um, in a typical setup uh, with classification in general, sort of this sort of self-training um, is, is not performed. Um, on the other hand, there are differences with classifiers in terms of how, how easily they can be updated with, m with more training data. And that's something which is very easy to do with a, with a Rocky Hill classifier. So if we find, if we're given more training data, we could very easily just uh, include that into uh, our centroids, and they would sort of move around to a slightly other place in our space, and we would have an, have an updated, hopefully more accurate model. For certain other, more complex classifiers, it, it's more, uh, it, it's less straightforward to to just update uh, a model if you provide it with more training data. And typically, the whole whole classifier needs to be um, retrained. <coughs> 
Uh, okay, S but um, we were actually talking about these um, decision boundaries. Um, also, one more note, just to to make sure no one's no one's confused. We don't we don't sort of explicitly compute these boundaries that are are drawn here. Um, they just happen to sort of correspond to the classification decisions that we make based on this nearest centroid rule. Okay, so so these these decision boundaries, these sort of uh, hyperplanes in our space corresponding to to how we separate the classes, uh, for Rocky classifier they will just be sort of implicit. Okay, let's look at now that we've we've s we've talked about how these decision boundaries are um, uh, end up being defined for a Rocky classifier. We'll, we'll spend some time talking about problems with um, with the class boundaries computed by by Rocky classifiers. Um, one important thing that this nearest centroid classifier uh, does is that it, it ignores sort of the, the local distribution of members within a class. So the classification decision is only based on this distance to the centroids. Um, but we'll see some examples of, uh, of cases where, where that sort of very simple straightforward classification rule uh, uh, misses important information that it, that it could have used namely this, this local distribu distribution of members within classes. Um, it also comes with sort of an uh, implicit assumption that the regions corresponding to the classes corresponds to, to spheres, um, and spheres that are uh, have roughly the same diameter. Um, and this means that uh, Rocchio classifiers may be sort of a bad fit for classes where the class region is, is actually sort of stretched out in the space, or, or correspond to, to some other sort of irregular shape uh, that is non-spherical. Um, another important limitation is that um, the decision boundary that it computes is is linear, and that means it's only suitable for classification problems that are what we call linearly separable. So, if we go back to the slide here, uh, we see the uh, these decision boundaries computed in the space, we see that uh, uh, they're linear. Well, uh, and in this case, that works well, but there might be other classification problems where it wouldn't be possible to sort of, in, in two dimension, two dimensions like here, draw a straight line uh, and still actually separate uh, the examples from the different classes. And that would mean we would have, an, have a non-linearly separable classification problem. Okay, let's we'll, we'll look at some some more visual examples to to provide some more sort of intuitions and make things a bit more concrete uh, regarding these these comments that I just made about um, some of the more problematic aspects of, of the Rocky Hill classifier. So here's sort of the, the ideal case for uh, how the classes should be distributed. Uh, for Rocky classifier. Um, so we have two classes here, A. Uh, so all the A's here are uh, um, examples in our training data. And then the B's are examples of the other class in our training data. And then the circles here corresponds to the two centroids for the two classes. And then we have a decision boundary corresponding to the the line in, in in the middle here, um, given by the all the points that are equally distant from these two centroids. Okay, and then we have a point X, which is an unlabeled item that we'd like to classify, and we see for this particular case it will be classified as belonging to the A class, right? Because it falls on on the left side of the classification boundary. And here everything serves the way we would hope it's um, uh, we'd, we'd like it to be. Um, and here the classes are distributed according to sort of the the ideal assumptions uh, uh, made by the Rocky classifier. They're roughly spherical in shape, and they are of roughly the same size. Uh, 
Okay, so here's an example of um, uh, two classes that are less ideal for given the assumptions implicitly made by, by the Rocky Hill classifier. So here we have not spherical, uh, spherically distributed uh, classes, but rather these sort of stretched out, elongated regions in the space. Um, so the classes A and B. And again, we're given uh, um, uh, the classes are represented by these two, two centroids, and we have a, a class boundary drawn up in the middle here. And now you see when we we are to classify an example, an unlabeled example X. So in this case, it will be classified as belonging to the class A. Well, it would seem sort of immediately, sort of visually clear to all of us that X should probably be classified as a B. If we had taken sort of the, the local distribution of the, the examples actually seen within the B class, if, if you had taken that, that distribution into account. But that's the whole problem with, with um, Rocky Hill classification for in cases like this. It, it's only based on the distance towards the centroid. And X is actually closer to the centroid of the A class than the B class. So here it's, it's we, we see an illustration of this problem that the, um, sort of the, the local regions or the local distribution of points within the classes is, 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 is ignored. Here's another example illustrating something similar. Um, again, we end up getting what would probably be a, a misclassification because it ignores the local distribution of points within the classes, but it also illustrates the problem with um, non-contiguous classes. So here we have, so within the class, whoops, within the class A, we see that the regions are sort of roughly spherical, but they're, they're non-adjacent in the space. They're uh, not contiguous, they're spread out. So this would be an example of, of what is sometimes called a multimodal class. So we have, uh, the class is clustered in, in two different regions in the space. But still, for the, ro the Rocchio classification model, it is limited to sort of computing a single centroid to represent this class. Um, and it's clear that it, it's a fairly bad fit for representing these, um, these non-contiguous classes. And again, X will be assigned to the A class because that, that has the nearest centroid. Whereas if we had been able to take the local distribution of points here into account, um, it seems clear that it, it should be labeled as a B. Yet another example. So this illustrates the problem with um, having sort of spherically distributed regions, but that are of uh, rather different sizes. So, so here we see that the, cl the, the B class is much larger than uh, than the class class A. So again, X should probably have been defined, uh, been classified as a B, but according to our Rocchio classifier, it will be assigned the class label A because that centroid is is nearer. Um, so one sort of workaround, which is sometimes done, if we if we know that we are working with uh, um, two sets of classes where, where one is a much larger class, a more spread out class than the other one, we can maybe ignore all these negative examples, the B class in this case, and instead just focus on the A class and and perhaps uh, make our classification make our classifications based on whether X falls within some given threshold in terms of the distance from uh, from the A centroid here. And maybe we would be better off just, just disregarding the, the, ba the B centroid. Okay, um, a final example in terms of where uh, the Rocchio classifier will have problems, namely with nonlinear uh, problems. Uh, classes that are, that are are not linearly separable. So here, again, represented in, in just two dimensions, it would be uh, there's no way we can just draw a single straight line uh, that correctly separates uh, the A examples from the B examples. Uh, 
So we would need to to separate these two classes from each other, even though they are sort of um, they form sort of contiguous regions in the space. But we would still need uh, to be able to draw up some some sort of nonlinear uh, boundary between them. Um, and the next classifier that we'll be looking at, the k nearest neighbor classifier, um, is actually a nonlinear classifier. So um, the KNA, KNN classifier would be able to to potentially co correctly classify uh, or correctly separate um, the classes we see here, and it would also potentially be able to to correctly classify uh, these other problematic ex examples that we just looked at. But before I turn to to KNN classification, I just thought I'd quickly uh, just point out some some uh, a side note about this issue of nonlinearity. Namely that um, if we have uh, classes that are nonlinearly separable within some feature space, um, it might still be possible to to correctly perform the classification with a linear classifier if we first sort of pro project the features into higher dimensional feature space. This is just a very simple example where we start out with just um, a single dimension. Um, so here we, ju we have just, uh, just the x dimension here and we have uh, examples of the class A and B. And we see that here the classes are, are not linearly separable. So, so in this case with just one dimension this would mean we're unable to, to define a single point um, uh, on this line that, uh, that separates the A's from the B's, right? But if we had just added one more dimension, uh, added a Y dimension, and um, like here, and define the values along, along this dimension to just be uh, the value of uh, along the X dimension um, squared, we see that with this simple projection, suddenly the points are actually linearly uh, separable. So now we, w we see that we're able to, to draw a single straight line and separate the, the A's from the B's. And uh, this idea of sort of defining mappings or projections into um, a higher dimensional space is the basis of uh, what is called kernel methods. Uh, within machine learning, which is another sort of important area of or, or um, important sort of family of um, of classifiers, um, but not something we'll go we'll go into the details of in in forty eight twenty. But it would be able to define sort of a, a kernel version of the Rockio classifier, for example. So that would mean rather than looking at the distances between features and and the centroids within the original feature space, we would first map map our feature space into a higher dimensional space. Okay, we will leave uh, leave kernels and let that be, and then move to uh, KNN classification instead. Um, and KNN stands for K nearest neighbor classification. Um, and KNN classifiers are an example of uh, of nonlinear classifiers, as opposed to Rockio classifiers, which are are linear. Um, and again, it's a fairly simple, straightforward um, framework. So with um, KNN, we basically represent the classes by just a collection of collection of members that we've been provided. Um, so this would be an example of what we call uh, uh, memory-based learning or instance-based learning when we talked about how to represent classes. And for k equals 1, KNN classification amounts to assigning a given object to be classified to um, uh, uh, whatever the class is of its closest neighbor within the space the vector space. Okay, so we're, we're given an item to be classified. We already have a vector space model with classes assigned to all the, all the points. Then we need to compute all the pairwise distances for this new point to be classified. And we find, okay, wha what point is the closest one? That's the, 
one nearest neighbor. And then the classification decision is basically just to say uh, our new unlabeled object should, ha should have the same class label as whatever its, its one nearest neighbor has. Or more generally, we look at not just the one nearest neighbor, but the, the k nearest neighbors. And we assign uh, the object to be classified with the same class labels as the, um, the majority of its k nearest neighbors. So sort of like uh, performing a majority vote. Um, so again, a fairly sort of intuitive, uh, easy to understand classifier. Um, and it seems sort of intuitively plausible. So the main idea here, the sort of underlying rationale, is just that we we would expect some new unlabeled object to have the same class label as uh, uh, the previously seen examples that are closest to it uh, within the feature space, right? Given given this underlying contiguity hypothesis that we talked about. Uh, uh, in the introduction, that we assume that the regions corresponding to the classes in the space are uh, are non-overlapping and and uh, contiguous, sort of coherent. Um, it's important to note that the k parameter, the number of neighbors to look at, is something that must be specified in advance, either just manually or through sort of uh, tuning, sort of optimizing that parameter um, uh, given the data. <coughs> it's typically chosen to be an odd number just to avoid uh, uh, ties. Okay, so in, in terms of uh, one of the main sort of differences compared to, to Rocchio classification is that uh, the KNN classifier actually does consider this this local distribution of points within the class, right? That's the whole idea here. It, it, um, rather than forming some sort of abstract uh, general representation of the class, um, uh, like we do with the centroids in Rocchio, KNN instead uh, relies on the, the actual given examples uh, seen in the training data, and it looks at just that sort of local region uh, of the class that the test object falls into, and bases the, the classification decision uh, on that. And we'll see that the these decision boundaries that um, the KNN classifier en ends up computing are defined uh, or, or can be explained or illustrated by something uh, known as um, the Voronoi tessellation. Okay, so that that's what you see here. Um, so Vo Voronoi was a, a mathematician and uh, uh, from I think he was half Ukrainian and or uh, and Russian um, in the nineteenth century. He, he defined these. Um, uh, these are called Voronoi diagrams, Voronoi Voronoi tessellation. Uh, tessellation is basically just sort of a, 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 a tiling of the space into geometrical shapes. Um, and with uh, Voronoi tessellation, uh, uh, that's something that's given by. So here we're assuming that that k equals one, and then for um a given set of of points here. Let this correspond to our training data. All the all the dots in the in the space here. Each of these points will um, um, define sort of a, a cell, um, a convex uh, polygon, which is defined by all the points that are closer to to uh, the, the that object in the space than any of the other ones. So for any given point, sort of, or, or black dot here, any given object, uh, the cell surrounding that point is given by, uh, is defined by all the points that are closer to, closer to that object than any of the other objects within the space. Okay, so this sort of decomposition um, into these these convex polygons uh, uh, is what is known as the, the Voronoi tessellation. <coughs> 
Um, and for the example here, it's um, it's defined for uh, for k equals one. But then we could compute this more generally for for any number of k, where the cells would be given by the regions. Uh, um, where all the points have the same set of, of k nearest neighbors. <coughs> okay, and we'll see how uh, how sort of this Voronoi tessellation, how this decomposition of the space into these polygons, how this defines uh, the class boundaries when performing uh, k nearest neighbor classification. So. Here again is the example from uh, uh, Manning, Ragalan and Schütze with three classes, with diamonds, circles, and um, the X's. And here the they've drawn up the uh, decision boundaries, the white line here, uh, that follows sort of the outline of some of these, these polygons in the Voronoi tessellation. Uh, that corresponds to the decision boundary if we do one nearest neighbor classification. Um, and it's we see immediately that uh, this shows sort of the, the non-linearity of the K and N classifier. So they're they're locally linear uh, along each cell, but we see that the decision boundary as a whole is uh, uh, is non-linear. Um, in the actual example here, again, the, the star corresponds to a point that is to be classified. And we see that for one nearest neighbor classification, um, we, would get we would get it uh, correct. It would be classified as, uh, as a circle. If we had done three nearest neighbor classification here, which, is which the circle here corresponds to, it would have been assigned the X label instead. Okay, so just a quick note on some slight variations on how uh, k-nearest neighbor classification can can be done. So it's possible to define sort of what we can call so softened versions of of k and n. So this goes back to what we talked about initially with um, how we can represent membership, how that can be either hard or or soft. Um, so we could define sort of a probabilistic version of KNN, for example, where we take, we say that a, a given item to be classified like X here, rather than saying that it's um, uh, it's either part of the class A or part of the class B, we could assign all the, um, the class labels to probability based on the proportion of neighbors um, uh, from each class. So here, in the example here, we use K equals five, look at the five nearest neighbors, we see that three of them are from the A class and two from the B class. So we could say that the probability of X belonging to A is 0.6 and the probability of X belonging to B is 0.4, for example. Another simple variation that we could introduce is to use distance weighting. <coughs> So here we could still choose to use sort of hard memberships to assign sort of X to a single class. But we could base that decision on not just looking at the five nearest neighbors, which would assign it to, to the class A in the example here, since according to the majority votes, uh, most, of the, most of the neighbors uh, are from the class A. But we could introduce distance weighting in, uh, in addition, so that the different classes vote um, not just in terms of the number of neighbors that uh, are among the k nearest neighbors, but also how, how far they are from the point to be classified. So here, for example, we would then more likely end up classifying x as a b, even though only two of the neighbors is from the class b versus three from a, because the b examples are, are way closer. Um, okay, so just very simple sort of slight variations that I want to do um, for this classifier. Um, 
Okay, so before we leave KNM, I just thought I mentioned some idiosyncrasies of uh, um, the KNM classifiers. So one is one point to note is what I, I think also mentioned at the first first slide when introducing KNMs is that there's not really any learning going on here at all. So for the Rockio classifier, the uh, uh, amount of learning that actually uh, happened was also fairly modest. Um, in terms of learning, all that sort of happened for the Rockio classifier was computing these these centroids. But for KNN, there's really it, there's absolutely no learning going on at all. It just it just it's given the training data and it just stores the training data and then it's done. Then it's happy. It just memorizes all the training examples. That's the model. So instead, all the sort of work <laughs> goes into uh, the actual classification. Actually, sort of when, when the, the classifier is applied, that's when it uh, the KNN classifier needs to to do all the work. Um, and generally, with machine learning methods, the rule is sort of the um, the more the merrier. So the the more data we throw at the model, the the better it gets. So you generally want to have as, as much training data as possible. But for um, k nearest neighbor classification, it has this peculiarity that, that a large training set actually means um, sort of a penalty uh, in terms of efficiency when it comes to performing classification. Because th the test time here is linear um, to the size of the training set because it needs to make all these pairwise comparisons each new item to be classified, we'll need to measure the distance of that object to all the all the training examples to in order to, to determine what are the, the nearest neighbors. So performing classification, uh, so applying the classifier is, is expensive. So the nice thing is that it's independent of the, the number of classes uh, um, that we want to uh, that we want to separate. So that's a potential advantage if you have problems that have have many classes, large multi-class class problems. Um, another thing to note is the similarity to just basic um, retrieval, so as in information retrieval. So, for example, when we when we search for relevant documents given a search query, so there as well the sort of whole problem is actually just computing the nearest neighbors in the space. So remember, initially today we talked about the use of vector space models in information retrieval. And we said that the, the query could be represented as a feature vector um, as well, and that all the documents in our document collection would correspond to feature vectors. And the problem of finding, retrieving a ranked list of the most relevant documents um, would amount to computing all the distances distances that all the documents have um, towards this query vector, and this is exactly this k nearest neighbor problem, right? We'd like to find uh, uh, k nearest documents for this query. So this is so just sort of um, ad hoc retrieval giving a. A search query is, is very similar to the problem we're, we're trying to solve in, in, in KNN. Okay, so for oblig obligatory assignment uh, 2B, that should wake you up, is uh, well you'll actually be implementing a Rockio classifier um, for yourself. So you'll build on what you've done for 2A. So for 2A, you're uh, constructing this vector space model for a set of words that you've been given um, based on these bag of word features extracted from the brown corpus like we talked about but then for 2b we'll, uh, we'll build on this and we'll provide a set of um, class labels for each of these words in the word uh, in the file words.txt uh, that you were given for 2a these 122 words for for most of the words in that list, not all of them, we'll provide class labels. Uh, and then the problem uh, for you to solve is to then implement a Rockio classifier to predict 
the class labels for a remaining set of, of unlabeled words. So here are some examples. So these will be the classes um, that you're given. So uh, the classification problem will be about sort of identifying sort of the abstract semantic conceptual category um, for the verbs in your model. So the the sort of rather random collection of uh, of labels or concepts that we'll be dealing with are the ones you see here: food, institutions, titles, place names, and person names. And then you see examples for all of these classes taken from this uh, this word list that you're already working with um, for 2A. So examples of food in the training data will be things like potato, or just the word food, bread fish, eggs, and so on. So this will be your training data. Um, and you've already computed the feature vectors for these, right? It's for, for 2A. So in 2B, it's just a matter of um, associating them with, uh, with these class labels. And then what you will need to do is then compute centroid vectors representing the class food, the centroid vector representing the class institution, a centroid vector representing uh, the conceptual class of titles, and so on. And then there are some words left from from uh, from our word list that are unlabeled, that are labeled as just unknown. And then the idea is to, based on the distance that these words have to the these class centroids that you've computed, assign them the correct uh, not necessarily correct, but <laughs> at least assign them some uh, some class label. So the goal is then to decide uh, what sort of conceptual category here should department uh, uh, be assigned. Is it a person name? Is it a place name? Is it institution or is it food? Um, and to B will be out in uh, next week. So the the deadline for two A is next Wednesday, and then. 2B will be uh, available that, that same that same day. Um, okay, so the remaining thing that I'd like to talk about, uh, but sh which we won't have time to do today, um, uh, relates to how to evaluate a classifier. So we now talked about different classifiers and uh, how to to represent classes, how to represent class memberships, and what this notion of, of decision boundaries or uh, class boundaries, what that amounts to. Uh, but what we haven't talked about yet is how to actually evaluate these decision boundaries that we compute. How do we evaluate the decisions made by classifiers? Um, so we'll say that for um, the next lecture. So then we'll talk about evaluating classifiers, uh, and we'll also turn to this other sort of main categorization task within machine learning, namely clustering, the sort of unsupervised uh, counterpart of, of uh, classification. Okay, I think we'll stop there for, for today.